Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, we are going to start our webinar. My name is Sardar Yilmaz, and together with Jamie Boix, I lead the Public Sector Alliance. Before we jump into today's program, I would love to say a few words, especially today's seminar marks the fifth round of our year-long global, web, global webinar series on decentralization and localization in countries around the world. Last year, September and December, we had webinar series on decentralization in Asia and Africa. Then earlier this year, we had the third and fourth round of seminar webinar series focused on decentralization and localization in the Middle East and North, North Africa and Latin America regions. This webinar series is organized by the Local Public Sector Alliance together with a number of global partners, including World Bank, UNDP, UNCDF, USAID, and others. The Local Public Sector Alliance is a global alliance of advocates for more inclusive and efficient decentralization and localization. The alliance and its website, decentralization.net, were established as a platform for knowledge sharing on topics related to decentralization and localization. And we hope to bring together policy practitioners, scholars, government officials, and civil society organizations from around the world interested in achieving a more inclusive, responsive, and efficient public sector. As part of this wider aim, the objective of the current global webinar series is to elevate the debate on decentralization and localization around the world. In doing so, we don't want to promote a single view or a single approach to decentralization. Instead, we understand decentralization and localization as a means to an end for instance, better service to a more inclusive society, not as a goal in itself. This means that we are not only interested in understanding the state of decentralization in different parts of the world today, but also we want to understand the question of why. What are the political economic forces that drive decentralization reforms or the lack thereof? Another area of interest for our community is to understand opportunities for stakeholders, whether government officials, development partners, researchers, or civil society organizations, to leverage decentralization or localization to champion or co-create a more inclusive, efficient public sector. Since the Local Public Sector Alliance aims to be an alliance of the community of practice for the community of practice, by the comment of practice, we count on you, the attendees of today's event, to become an active part of the alliance. Please visit our website, decentralization.net. Register for our newsletter so we can keep you posted on future events. Contribute to the website by sharing a blog about decentralization and local governance in your country or research on a related topic. Or maybe you can co-host a webinar in the future. In any case, we very much appreciate everyone joining us today. On behalf of the Local Public Sector Alliance, I would like to thank today's moderator and panelists for their willingness to be part of today's webinar. With that, let me pass the session to Adrian Inasco, who is moderating today's session. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Serdar. Um, good afternoon and good evening and good morning to you. Serdar. Um, my name is Adrian Ionescu. I'm a consultant on decentralization and local development, and I work currently for UNDP in Moldova and UNDP in Uzbekistan. And I'm uh, truly pleased to welcome you to the first webinar uh, on decentralization in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, today's webinar provides a comparative analysis of decentralization of subnational governance in the region of Europe and, and Central Asia. Uh, the webinar is presented by the Local Public Sector Alliance together with NALAS, the Network of Associations of Local Authorities in Southeastern Europe, and UNDP. As you know, in, in Europe and in the 
Caucasus countries, uh, the countries structure their local governance and intergovernmental arrangements according to principles laid out in the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Uh, this charter lays down uh, standards for protecting the rights of local authorities and require states which have ratified it to comply with a number of conditions, principles, and practices. States undertake to respect a core of basic principles to which no reservation is possible, as for example, the right of citizens to participate in managing public affairs, the key rights of communities to enjoy autonomy and self-government, elect their local bodies, have their own structures and financial resources. This charter has uh, helped very much uh, the countries, the transition countries, uh, to, uh, to move from a centralized form of government to, to an increasingly decentralized uh, governance system. So the Council of Europe and the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of Europe have their own mechanism to monitor the status of local governance in, and to advise governments on how to improve it. But today we will take a look uh, at the recent history and the progress of decentralization in, in Eastern Europe um, and in Central Asia as well, using two uh, alternative sets of, uh, of instruments. One of them is prepared by the Network of Associations of Local Authorities in Southeastern Europe, NALAS, uh, by the, the Regional Decentralization Observatory. And the second one is the local autonomy uh, index um, by a group which is led by the University of Lausanne. Uh, the NALAS Regional Decentralization Observatory tracks continuously the progress of decentralization and local government, fiscal trends, and uh, um, evolution of public services in Southeastern Europe. The data of the observatory shows that the decades-long decentralization effort has had uh, successes, but there's also a trend or a threat of recentralization. This, this trend has started before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but it has accelerated during the crisis and it somehow culminates today as a result of the shortage and high prices of key resources, uh, inflation, economic crisis. The um, local autonomy index uh, data shows an increase of local autonomy between 1990 and 2020, uh, especially in the Central and Eastern European countries. After the two broad overviews, which will be presented um, sh shortly, uh, we will have two country uh, cases, Croatia and Kazakhstan, very different, uh, yet I would say each of them very relevant for their region. So let me briefly introduce today's presenters and uh, in the order in which they will contribute. So the first one will be uh, Elton Saf Saf Staffa from NALAS. Uh, then we will have uh, Alexander Bastian and from University of Lausanne, Nikos Klepas from the University of Athens, Pavel Svianievich from Wroclaw University of Environmental and Life Sciences. Then we will have Dario uh, Runtic from Croatian Association of Cities and Ainur Baimirza, Head of Governance Unit at UNDP in Kazakhstan. <clears throat> Just before we, we uh, pass to the substance of the conversation, I have to make some housekeeping an announcements. So uh, first of all, uh, we should all know that this is being recorded and there will be video highlights from this seminar series uh, posted to the decentralization.net. So we'll be able uh, to go back and, and see some of the highlights of the, of the session today. Um, I should also note that each presenter and panelist speaks in their own capacity, so they do not speak on behalf of their institutions. Uh, you have also, because this is a Zoom uh, webinar, you have the possibility to use the Q&A feature. Um, so if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please use that feature. 
Uh, there is a lot of content to cover. It, the session will last about 90 minutes. And um, I will ask the panelists to make the, the share the presentations, each one by one. And you can, uh, as I said, put your questions in the Q&A. And after the presentation, we'll take time to respond to, to the uh, questions. And I hope you'll have questions. If you don't have questions, Serdar and I will certainly have some for, for the uh, presenters. So now I'm going to pass the floor to Elton uh, Staffa, who will make the opening presentation. Elton, please. Well, thank you, Adrian. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and then share some of the, the results uh, or some of the findings of the work that, that uh, at NALAS we have been doing for uh, quite some time um, in the region. Let me share the presentation. Um, right. All right, so this is not it. Yeah. All good now, I guess, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, as I said, uh, I mean, it's it's a great pleasure to be here and share with you the result of the sum of the work that we have been doing uh, at, the, at the local level in, in Southeast Europe. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with NALAS, NALAS is the network of the associations of local authorities in Southeast Europe. So it's an umbrella organization bringing together um, the local government associations from all over Southeast Europe. As you can notice here, we have all the Balkans and, and then uh, we go up uh, with Romania, Moldova and so on. Also in Turkey, our members in Turkey, they include the Marmara region. Uh, so this is about NALAS and the geographical coverage that, that, that we have. And uh, I'm really glad that we have today with us also my friend and colleague uh, Dario Luntic from the Association of Croatian Cities so to, to present um, in more detail one of the cases um, of uh, the region. Um, as as uh, as you mentioned, uh, we uh, we have been trying to track progress of decentralization of different aspects of decentralization in Southeast Europe uh, since the creation of the, the onset of NALAS, and then we do this basically uh, uh, with some of the tools that we, uh, we use to do this. Actually, our um, uh, studies and, and, and reports that we prepare on an annual basis, focusing on uh, fiscal decentralization and also then uh, the, the quality and then the performance in solid waste management as the most typical uh, local government finance uh, local government function in uh, in the region um and these uh, year efforts or this we have been doing these studies for for more than a decade and, and now in now this <clears throat> all this work has got culminated in the regional decentralization observatory we've built an index uh, uh, for uh, for this um, uh, based on this trying to capture the progress of decentralization uh, based on the autonomy of local governments on uh, the quality of services uh, quality of local uh, services uh, citizen participation and uh, local government responsiveness and also intergovernmental dialogue um, so we have uh, uh, started to implement uh, this uh, this new way of, of capturing pro progress, so to say, um, some years ago. And here in this chart, we see the <clears throat> we see the general results for the average uh, uh, in Southeast Europe. Uh, so the scores are from one to ten, uh, and um, basically this is a snapshot of the overall situation in Southeast Europe. So the average for all countries uh, of Southeast Europe that are also members of NALAS, where this index has been uh, uh, implemented. As you can see here, we have uh, four four key dimensions, uh, uh, and which are based then on seventeen indices, nine sub indices, and ninety seven indicators. About two thirds, about a little more than a third of these indicators are quali uh, quantitative indicators um, and the rest is uh, qualitative indicators are based also on expert opinion and so on. Um, I would like to say also that this index uh, builds uh, builds a lot, in particular as regards the first dimension of local autonomy, builds a lot also on the, the lie index uh, that will be the results of which will be also presented by the colleagues in, the, in their uh, later presentation. So, as we can see in general, with this uh, general uh, and probably a little bit extensive intro, uh, in terms of autonomies in Southeast Europe, local governments fare quite well, I would say, 7.5, uh, considering everything. Um, so, um, there is a good framework for local governance in the region on average. 
the two dimensions on which we are uh, also lagging, we are lagging behind, uh, it's, it's the quality of local services and then participation and responsiveness. Uh, as regards intergovernmental dialogue, the scores are relatively higher also because the local government associations in the region, they are very uh, active, they are quite active and um, they have positioned themselves um, in, in a, uh, a very effective way as regards intergovernmental dialogue. But these two other dimensions on which uh, uh, um, the scores are, are uh, much lower, of course, they also depend on the, 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 the scores or the, the indicators in the other uh, dimensions, but these tell a big story, so to say. So it tells a big story that in general, uh, uh, there are good conditions, for decentralization to work in the region, but there is some something that's kind of impeding this. And then and, uh, one of these things that is somehow in the in the way of, of having better progress uh, or better results in terms of quality of services is uh, the resources. It's the basically <clears throat> the resources uh, available to, to the local government. So here we try to see in a bit more detail what the score on dimension one autonomy of local governments, uh, what the sc scores for in more details are. As you can notice here, as the political decentralization scores 8.6, so it's it's quite advanced, and also the administrative decentralization we, we score quite well. And then when it comes to fiscal decentralization, the score is 6.4. So it, it, there's a huge difference between uh, uh, um, one set of, of um, um, uh, one set of, of uh, things that need to be taken care of when it comes to decentralization and then lagging behind on the on the rest. So basically, with the general conclusion that there are good conditions, but probably there are insufficient resources. And in fact, when we look also at the, the analysis work on fiscal decentralization, we, we, this comes as a confirmation. So in, in this chart, we basically see local government finance as a percent of the GDP in Southeast Europe, a comparison between in Western Balkans, Southeast Europe, and also the EU. Uh, and this is pre-COVID data. This is pre-COVID uh, data. So uh, while it's difficult to say, you know, how, how much local governments should be uh, provided, there is some uh, general agreement that they are uh, uh, generally underfunded in the region, although it's difficult to say, you know, how, by how much, but there is a general underfunding uh, uh, and that they, they also do not receive a fair share of uh, the overall fiscal pie. So uh, this uh, comes, you know, as, as a background of many, many other um, the studies and then more information that you may find in, the, in our reports. And also what we notice even now in these pre-COVID times, there is a stagnation of uh, local government finance reform. So uh, some reforms have, have, have uh, advanced quite well. Uh, there is uh, ongoing progress as regards administrative decentralization, but when it, when it comes to making big impact uh, local finance uh, decisions, then the situation is a little bit uh, more difficult than also these, these uh, challenges that we're facing, you know, first with COVID and then Croatia and Albania also with the earthquake. Uh, and now the impact of the war in Ukraine, this does not make things uh, easier for, um, for local governments, I would say. Um, and also from a, a regional comparative perspective, as you could see here, there are wide differences uh, across local governments, you know, across local government finance in uh, in the region. So the chart basically shows us local government revenue in per capita terms. And um, as you can notice, there are wide differences in, in all the countries, so even even uh, in those countries where uh, local governments have similar, similar functional responsibilities. So one of those examples, for, for example, is between Albania and Serbia, where local governments have more or less same set of uh, responsibilities, but then the, finding, uh, the financing for local government services, it's, uh, it's, it's significantly different. And, in other per capita indicators between the Republic of Ser Serbia and Albania, you, you don't see this uh, this this big difference, you know, of more than two two times. Uh, so this is uh, somehow uh, is crystallized in the, in the in, or at least what we find out. It's one of the, the the key challenges that local governments in Southeast Europe face is the lack of sufficient financial resources, which definitely has direct impact on on the quality and the access of service. Then, of course, then the, there are also the other pro problems of um, uh, citizen participation in decision making and also um, uh, local government accountability. So all these uh, uh, governance elements they have a huge impact on the quality of services. But the lack of financial resources probably it's one of the most important uh, ones. 
Um, and uh, I guess we have also colleagues that are joining us from other parts of the world and they are also interested in, in terms of uh, accessing data and information about local governance. We have published uh, uh, all the data that, that uh, we have and all the information that we have, reports that we prepare. You may find them in the NALAS Observatory, which is kind of a knowledge hub for the region. Uh, where uh, you know also researchers and policymakers, practitioners can access and find some good data uh, and comparable data uh, for uh, all over the, the region. Um, in terms of some more general, sorry, in terms of some more general remarks about the, um, the progress of decentralization. So, what are the key achievements? Let's say. Uh, in Southeast Europe, we would say that uh, from a general perspective, we notice that uh, uh, the legal framework is in place. So the centralization strategies have been adopted, the legal framework has been developed and is being complemented somehow. Uh, there is improved fiscal decentralization, so there are ongoing reforms or parts of reforms ongoing in, in, in many of the countries in the region. And perhaps also one that is very, very important, I think, also for the future, uh, is the, there is a renewed trust in uh, in local governments and, and and also in many places there is also an increased support uh, for uh, for uh, lo local um, for local governments. Uh, in terms of uh, key challenges, uh, sorry, okay, all right. So in terms of key challenges, of course, political instability is a common factor in many places in the region. So maybe mm, uh, political instability plus political polarization, because also political polarization is as, as damaging to decentralization as, as instability. Then uh, in some, some places, there are obvious security concerns that somehow you know are a big challenge to making big discussions or uh, these inclusive discussions about um, yeah, local government reforms. Of course, then the COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine make the picture even more complicated. Uh, insufficient intergovernmental dialogue and cooperation. So almost everywhere in the region there is progress in this dimension but however in the consultant uh, consultation mechanism that exists usually usually not always the case but usually central governments they have a uh, they have a, a strong decision making power so they are the ones that are setting the agenda and the rest is kind of trying to follow the the, the agenda it's not so this can be brought you know, to, to the next level where local governments are much more involved and consulted since the early stages of preparation and also can contribute in setting the agenda so that they are not only recipients of uh, the decisions that have been made, but this is finding that's basically it's, called, it's going also beyond the region of Southeast Europe. I mean, this is a, a general finding for Europe, but also uh, for, for other uh, in other continents. Um, then another key challenge is somewhere the decentralization processes, they are not complete. And they are missing uh, uh, extents. They are missing significant parts, either in terms of fiscal decentralization or in terms of political decentralization, and, and so on. Then, uh, in, so as it when it comes to capacities and also resources, um, I would say that this is a challenge for both levels of government. Um, I've been involved in the, the reform processes for some time in Albania. Uh, and uh, we have tried to, to follow up and uh, support reform processes also in other places where uh, our member associations have uh, requested our support. And this issue of capacities, I would say, is for both levels of government. It's not only about local governments uh, not having significant capacity, but also the national government uh, having problems with with, uh, with capacities. But the key challenge, so to say, to, to complete this, uh, this part, the key challenge would be um, this continued Caesar effect. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with this uh, from the, the all the work and research that has been done uh, in the past, in particular during the COVID, that, you know, during this period, local government revenues they are falling down whether expenses they are going up okay now the situation with the war in ukraine uh, and somewhere also the the, the impacts of, of uh, natural additional natural disasters uh, will make it even more challenging because the caesar effect it seems that it will continue to be there and we we would really have to learn how to make more with uh, with less and less. Um, in terms of opportunities, uh, I guess um, uh, the COVID uh, crisis, at least it's the most generic one, um, uh, generated some momentum to rethink uh, multi-level uh, governance framework. So uh, in, in some places, you know, the, the entire system was put uh, in, in huge pressure. Those that were significantly centralized, so to say, had problems of flexibility. Those that were uh, uh, in those uh, countries where the, the, the system was much more decentralized, that they had the, uh, the opposite problem that 
of coordination. So some bargain has to, to some uh, agreement has to be reached there. And then and this crisis has helped to really make the case that uh, um, we would need to involve local governments more in in, uh, in uh, the designing of the policy, not in the, not only in the implementation of the policy, but in the designing uh, and, and implementation of the policy. Again, this point of renewed trust, uh, I think it's very, very important and really provides an opportunity for us to move forward. Then the EU integration process, uh, and this is uh, uh, an international solidarity, you know, for, for the challenges that the region has been facing. Uh, I guess this is also quite quite relevant uh, for um, for as, as a big opportunity. Uh, and also the local government associations in the region, they remain very, very active and then committed to supporting uh, intergovernmental dialogue and also the, the reform agenda, actually. Um, in terms of next and uh, next steps, uh, what I Elton, I'm, I'm, yeah. Elton, really sorry because we are running yeah. late. So please All right. just summarize. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, of the next step, basically, it's, uh, the, the, it's not a rocket science. At the end of the day, what, what we have been saying for a long time, and many, many of us as uh, practitioners or researchers have been uh, saying for a long time, build dialogue and strengthen, strengthen multi-level go governance, work together uh, to, to, to uh, develop the strategies that we need, and also, mo much more importantly, to provide this balance between responsibilities and resources, because at the end of the day, the opposite is, is a risk sub for for a failure so we've seen uh we've seen this uh deployed in, in many many other places all right this is it thank you uh, thank you very, very much elton and and sorry for uh, rushing you no, off uh your uh, presentation actually has um, um is showing uh, a bit of interest from our attendees and you have uh, three questions in the q a um uh, window so you could have a look and we're going to to try to run over these questions uh, at the end because they might be um similar to the next set of presentations so um i am giving the floor to alexander bastian and from the university of lausanne thank you very much um for giving me a few minutes of, uh, of time to uh, present an introductory overview of the Local Autonomy Index. For more details, I will uh, refer you to the webinar I've attended a few weeks ago, also in a part of the LPSA. Uh, and also all the information is available, publications, etc., on the website. So just a few words here uh, before I uh, leave the floor to my two colleagues who will present uh, more results of the countries that are that we are interested in today. Um, so the origin of the local autonomy index actually comes from a um, a research managed by the, the European Commission and a renewed uh, call for tender, which was um, which was during uh, 2020 and over the course of 2020 to 2021 in 15 months, we produced this research, which covers uh, 57 countries, uh, including uh, all EU member states, uh, almost all Council of Europe member states and OECD member states. Uh, from 1990 to 2020. Of course, here are a few exceptions. Uh, there are countries which did not exist in 1990, which were added. I could notably say in this case, the examples of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do we how do we measure decentralization through the local autonomy index? Uh, it's mostly based on the European Charter of Local Self Government, which was mentioned in the introduction of this webinar. Um, from that and theoretical considerations from the literature on local government studies, uh, we do find um, eleven variables, uh, eleven components, let's say, from local autonomy, which we then, uh, for clarification purposes and to to, to reduce complexity, were put into seven dimensions and then uh, with a certain uh, weighting formula, which again, the details you will find in our various reports and studies and publications, uh, brings us to a to one index, which we call the LAI. So uh, how is the, the local autonomy index then used? Uh, this is uh, very interesting. We've had a lot of, um, a great reception of the index so far. So we have had many echoes in the global academic community. Uh, 
a lot of um, a lot of literature has risen from uh, our previous research. Uh, it has been mentioned as one of the most uh, robust existing decentralization indexes alongside the regional authority index. Uh, it is for sure a core feature of co a comparative public administration. And on the uh, less academic side of things, but more into a um, practical uh, use, um, the LAI has proven to be an, uh, a good institutional indicator of decentralization used by notably the OECD to base um, policy recommendations uh, on. Um, and then also the Council of Europe and uh, more specifically the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities have uh, based um, some of their monitoring of the European Charter uh, on, on scores um, that were uh, released by the by our research in the local autonomy index. And uh, so in, in, in general, just to keep it very short here, um, the local autonomy index does provide to be a, a solid and comprehensive springboard uh, and a tool to be used by other academics uh, or policy makers. Um, again, for additional information, I would like you to refer uh, to our uh, official website, which includes all of the data. So separate coding sheets for all 57 member states that we have we have currently as part of the index. Um, so individual coding sheets per country, but also the full uh, database, which is freely to use. Um, we have a set of country profiles. So these are detailed rep uh, reports of the, um, of how uh, how we observe trends in the scores of local autonomy amongst countries, and they provide the necessary explanations and justifications as to how these changes have occurred. Uh, so some of these changes will be mentioned by by my colleagues later on, but we also have a whole set of publications. So the reports that were uh, that were drafted for the European Commission, but also our uh, our first book, which was uh, which is patterns of, of local autonomy, and uh, various articles that have used the index um, as such. So thank you very much. Uh, I've kept it very short because I want to leave most of the time to my two colleagues to go into the details of the and the results, trends and developments of the of the local autonomy index and the regions we are looking at today. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And before uh, passing uh, to Nikos, just want to say two things. Uh, one is that um, we will post the links that you see on the slides in the chat, so you can uh, the attendees can actually access the links and and memorize them for further use. Uh, second, uh, I forgot to mention it at the beginning. This uh, session is also translated into Russian, and you can access the translation. There is a round globe uh, at the bottom of your screen saying interpretation can select the Russian channel. Um, so Nikos, please, with the second um, item of LAI. Sorry, I was telling that Alexandra uh, explained the local autonomy uh, index. Um, I, I have to explain something also about our uh, uh, methodology. Um, the, the, the group, uh, the main group uh, of uh, researchers um, included our uh, country group coordinators. And uh, I have been the country group coordinators for, for six countries. These six countries included Israel, and the rest of the five countries are the countries that I'm going to, to present today. In this presentation, I will not only present uh, findings and tendencies uh, based on the local autonomy index, uh, but I will also refer uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the democratic uh, regime or the distance to, uh, to democracy in each one of these five countries, uh, according to the Democracy Index of the um, um, Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, it is not completely irrelevant to, to autonomy, uh, the, the, the quality of democracy in each country. And uh, something else that I'm going to add to the findings of this local autonomy index, index are uh, findings that we had from local experts concerning the image of local government in each one of these uh, countries, which I believe that it is um, um, quite important uh, because uh, the, the, the image, the support of the public 
for, for local government uh, can be a very important factor for decentralization reforms. So my five countries are very different. Uh, they include uh, Russia, which is uh, the biggest uh, country in Europe, both in um, area and uh, um, population. Then Turkey, which is the second biggest country in Europe, both in terms of area and uh, population. Then Greece, which is a small country, and then two very small island republics, uh, Cyprus and uh, Malta. So uh, starting with uh, Russia, um, Russia is considered, uh, was considered to be a hybrid regime up to 2010. And uh, since uh, 2011, it is considered to be an authoritarian uh, type. Uh, and it belongs to a group of six countries where local autonomy was found to be uh, very low. And it is the only big country among these countries. Um, the other countries are small countries. It reports a score of nearly 38, which is the lowest out of uh, 57 countries that have been investigated. Uh, it is also one of the two countries reporting a score of only zero for institution, institutional depth. Among the, the, the seven dimensions of local autonomy, Russia reports its highest score for uh, legal uh, autonomy and in its lowest score for policy discretion. Policy discretion means uh, the effective discretion that uh, local authorities have when exercising their, their tasks, their responsibilities. Um, concerning the main tendencies, what we can say about uh, Russia is that uh, um, the local government uh, started uh, practically in the early 90s. In the beginning, uh, local government was a responsibility of the regions, and since 2003, a unitary legal base has been created. Uh, there was a gradual increase in autonomy scores, but uh, since 2014, there is a, a decrease. Main functions are land use and uh, housing, while the other functions are very limited. Concerning uh, the image of citizens, there is a, a moderate satisfaction, and it is very characteristic that uh, Russian citizens consider local government to be not at all important in their daily life. Uh, quite striking is the level of electoral turnout, which is extremely no, low, only 25%. It's, it's the lowest among all the countries that we have been investigating. The second country is uh, Turkey, yeah? Turkey, Turkey uh, which according to the democracy index is a hybrid regime and belongs to a group of 11 countries with medium low degree of local autonomy. It has the third, low, it has the, the third lowest score for uh, political uh, discretion, uh, but it, it has a score over the mean for the financial transfer system, administrative supervision, and interactive law, uh, rule. Uh, among the seven dimension, Turkey reports its highest score for non-interference. Uh, we will uh, come back to this when we uh, talk in the end about our uh, findings. Uh, Turkey is well known for uh, its liberalization reforms in the 80s. It, uh, it also triggered decentralization reforms and the drive towards EU membership. Uh, there was a comprehensive administrative reform agenda emerging. However, there is an obvious recentralization uh, trend following the referendum of 2010. Uh, many dimension remain uh, stable. A a among the, the functions of local government, land use and public transport are particularly important. And uh, these are also the functions where there is a, a stronger, um, there is a stronger um, discretion. Uh, what is quite striking is that uh, citizens are mostly satisfied. They consider local government to be very important in daily life. Um, and uh, electoral turnout is very high, while local level politicians are generally considered to be more trustworthy than national politicians. We will come back to that. 
Greece is used to be a full democracy uh, up to the crisis, and since the beginning of the crisis is a flawed democracy. It belongs to a group of countries with a medium high level of autonomy. And among the seven dimensions, uh, Greece reports its highest uh, score for non-interference. Um, there were successive waves of decentralization reforms, and uh, but uh, the, the unprecedented austerity, austerity measures after the crisis challenged the decentralization dynamics uh, in these uh, countries. Functions are mm, relatively important for education, uh, where also political discretion scores are quite high. Uh, in, in, in Greece, uh, citizens are uh, moderately satisfied with local service uh, delivery. They consider local government to be very important in their daily life, uh, but they are not um, very satisfied with the local democracy. Turn, uh, turnout is not high, and local politicians are generally considered to be more trustworthy than national politicians. Cyprus is also uh, a regime of a flow democracy. Uh, it has a quite a low score of uh, local autonomy. And um, citizens are also moderately satisfied with local service and consider local government to be somewhat important in, in daily life. Uh, local level politicians are not considered to be trustworthy. Malta is also a float democracy, belongs to the same group of countries like um, Cyprus and is the smallest countries among them. Um, uh, similar to Cyprus, a modern legal framework for local government uh, has been um, established uh, um, in the 90s and scoring increased before and uh, after EU membership. The, the same happened also in, in Cyprus. Um, in, in Malta, citizens are generally moderately satisfied with local service delivery, and local government is considered to be somewhat uh, important in daily life. Uh, lev uh, local level politicians are considered to be rather trustworthy and certainly more trustworthy than national politicians. I'll come to, uh, now to main findings and questions for further research. Out of uh, these countries, none of them is uh, what you would call a, a champion of local autonomy. Uh, in the cases of Cyprus and Malta, small scale of the country and also British colonial heritage to some extent offer an explanation for uh, this uh, backwardness co concerning the centralization where path dependency could be an explanation for Greece, which nevertheless is the only case where we have a slow but a considerably increase in, in autonomy. In the case of Turkey, and especially in the case of Russia, perceptions about the primacy of national unity, and of course, the increasing authoritarian or hybrid threats seem to offer some explanation. Europeanization has triggered the centralization tendencies in Malta, Cyprus, and obviously in, in Greece, it has also triggered the centralization dynamics in Turkey, which have been abandoned uh, in the previous uh, decade. Um, particularly low levels of policy discretion uh, are not surprising for Turkey and especially for, for Russia. Uh, the, the, uh, the latter also reports very low scores in, in, in non-interference. Uh, the dimension of non-interference uh, includes the financial transfer system and the administrative uh, supervision and access, access to higher levels of uh, decision ma making. All other countries of this group report high scores for no interference and under the exception of Turkey, which is a big country with strict hierarchies, access. High scores of interference could theoretically reflect strong trust among the levels of governance. Um, uh, I mean, high levels of non-interference, yes. High levels of non-interference could theoretically reflect strong trust among the levels of governance, but could also be an indicator of deficits in transparency and accountability that often characterize clientelistic networks. Concerning the public image of local government, positive results in Turkey could reflect historical paths of loyalty to public authorities, 
but uh, a more optimistic understanding would imply the vivid nature of local politics and governance in Turkey that could possibly contribute to democratic renewal in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nikos. Um, I give the floor to Pavel Svianievic. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, I will start with sharing my screen. Um, okay, I think I am successful in th with that. Well, in my presentation, uh, since I cover the larger number of countries, I will not go into details, into discussion of any of individual countries, but I will just present some, of course, very simplified picture because we do not have a time for the details. So the picture has to be simplified, a simplified picture of uh, a variation in a groups, uh, in a subgroups uh, of countries. Uh, well, um, my uh, responsibility in the project was to organize and supervise data collection in most of post-communist Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, so, well, frankly speaking, I do not remember exact number of countries I had to um, supervise, it's about 20, I believe. And uh, so I've decided to group them, to cluster them in a few uh, groups to simplify the uh, um, uh, presentation. And most of my slides would be based on these um, sub, uh, subgroups. Uh, so the first group uh, is, uh, con con uh, consists of new member states who joined EU uh, in 2004, including Poland, which is my home country, and including uh, uh, Slovenia, which was also covered by Nala's presentation. The second group uh, are still new member states, but those who joined European Union after the 2004 in, in, in following years. And this group uh, consists of uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. The third group um, is a group of Western Balkan countries, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia, uh, Montenegro, and Serbia. And finally, the fourth group, uh, can well, some of the countries of former Soviet Republic, a Soviet Union. So Armenia, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. And just to give you a, a very general overview of uh, local autonomy and trends in local autonomy in those countries, I will start with a picture showing uh, local autonomy index in 2004, which means uh, at the uh, uh, last year covered by the first round, uh, first stage of local autonomy index project, uh, Alexander Bastianen, um, um, in his pre opening presentation, he, he told you about these two stages. So um, at, uh, in 2014, uh, the highest scores of local autonomy index in Europe uh, uh, was found in most of Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, uh, Denmark, to a bit lesser extent, Norway, Iceland, and Switzerland. And Poland, which was the front runner uh, among Central and Eastern Europe, was just behind this um, group of the most local autonomous uh, municipalities in Europe, which I mentioned a minute ago. Um, well, uh, Poland was followed then by Serbia, Czech Republic, Lithuania, and other countries. While the lowest, in 2014, the lowest level of local autonomy in this group could be found in Belarus, in Moldova, 
and then um, in Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine. Um, I indicate on this picture a part of uh, Poland, which is a sort of a leader or the champion of decentralization at that moment. I indicate also Slovakia for the reason which would be clear on the next picture, which presents um, scores of local uh, autonomy index in 2020. So Poland is still quite high on this scale comparing other countries of uh, Eastern Europe, but it's not a leader anymore. And the new leader is Slovakia, but very closely followed by Serbia, Estonia, and Lithuania. On the other extreme, we have the same countries which we had uh, for the 2014, Belarus and Moldova, uh, but next one from the bottom is Hungary, which is a, a new, um, a bit a new situation. I will uh, discuss this a, a bit, uh, very shortly in the following part of my presentation. If we look in longer trends from 1990 to 2020, uh, and if we a look not at individual countries because it would be too detailed picture and, and we would not manage to explain the picture in a brief presentation. But if we look at groups of the countries, we can see um, following um, key observations. First, the blue line at the top, uh, sorry, the blue line at the top is a line for old EU uh, countries, I mean, below, before the Great Extension in 2004. So it is still on the top. So countries of Eastern Europe are still sort of lagging behind in terms of uh, local autonomy index. But also we see that Eastern Europe has undergone a quite rapid decentralization process. Uh, this decentralization started first in new members, in first new member states. So this is a yellow line with Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Estonia, Slovenia, and so on. A bit later, in the second uh, half of 1990s, uh, especially, there was a rapid increase, increase of, of um, local autonomy index in the new member states uh, who joined EU later, I mean, Bulgaria, Romania, and, and Croatia. And uh, in the Balkans, the main decentralization trend was even more delayed until the beginning of, of uh, 2000, uh, 21st century. And in the former Soviet Union countries, Armenia, Moldova, um, Georgia, Ukraine, the process is still lagging behind with much slower but visible uh, decentralization trends. For example, in recent years, we had quite impressive uh, decentralization reform in, um, in Ukraine. Um, well, uh, we, have, uh, we see also that after the sharp increase in 1990s, the further trend was not so obvious, sometimes even with a decrease in the level of local autonomy um, due to uh, part of this might be explained by, uh, by financial crisis of 2008, but not only this. Uh, the second general observation we have to, uh, to make in this short presentation is that uh, especially if we concentrate on a part of local autonomy index, which focuses on uh, financial autonomy, then the difference between Eastern Europe and most of 
old EU uh, member states uh, is larger than in terms of overall um, local autonomy index. So this observation, this conclusion is going along with a conclusion made in the NALAS presentation um, in which it was shown that fiscal decentralization is the weakest point of local autonomy in southeastern Europe. So I would extend this uh, conclusion uh, to the whole uh, region of Central and Eastern Europe of the of a post a post communist Europe. And again, also on this picture, you may see this red line at the bottom, which illustrates uh, average score for uh, former Soviet Union countries, Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus, um, uh, which is the most lagging behind. And just to finish, because I've got just 10 minutes uh, for my presentation and I, my time is almost over, I would like to show the picture which sh shows that decentralization uh, and local autonomy is not granted forever. And um, we have some examples of countries which uh, in 1990s have undergone quite radical uh, decentralization reform, but recently uh, are examples of the quite, uh, uh, how to say, a very visible, a sharp trends uh, in an opposite direction in recentralization. So Hungary, presents uh, the first case of such a country with a radical drop of the level of local autonomy after, uh, after the 2011. And more recently, uh, after 2014 or after the 2015, unfortunately, because well, I'm now I'm talking about my own country and I think that this is a bad, a wrong process, we have um, less sharp, less dramatic that in Hungary, a process of recentralization also in Poland. Uh, there might be uh, different uh, reasons, different motives of recentralization. One is pragmatic and examples of that motive uh, might be um, tightening control over uh, borrowing rights by local authorities in times of um, economic crisis, uh, but it is not um, a, a sufficient explanation for the decentralization in Hungary and Poland. Another one, another um, motive is a more ideological um, related to the desire or, or the belief of, of a, a political party which is in power that centralist um, uh, centralized state might be more um, efficient and that the control over independent actors of uh, social and political life, including uh, local governments, uh, is a proper uh, solution for the, um, for the development of a country, uh, which in my opinion is a wrong, it's a, it's, a, it's a wrong diagnosis, but this is the case of both of the countries. Uh, so this thank is, uh, well, my time is over and uh, thank you for your attention. This is a, a very brief, simplistic summary of a picture in Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Pavel. And we are uh, delayed, but I hope you agree with me that the presentations were uh, were interesting and the, the reflections on the trends, especially uh, as well, very, very interesting and uh, relevant. Uh, there is a question uh, for clarification here, uh, Pavel. Uh, somebody asks, uh, the index presented in the third presentation follows what methodology? It is the same methodology as 
Microphone. Yes. Microphone. <laughs> yes, it is exactly the same. It's part of the same project. It's the same methodology which Alexander presented at the beginning. What might be the confusing is that we have sort of two ways of presenting uh, the final score. One is zero to 100 and Nikos followed this and I was following the alternative zero to 38, I believe, but methodology is basically the same. Thank you very much, Pavel. I, I was looking at um, at the bars there, and uh, um, I'm working in Moldova, and I can see Moldova was scoring uh, quite quite far um, at the at the bottom in terms of uh, um, performance, let's say, in in decentralization. But uh, I I should also say that uh, I can see a progress there. So you measured in 2014 and then in 2017. In 2012, we worked on a comprehensive decentralization strategy with the government of Moldova, and that became, uh, became a law. And in 2015, there was a new um, law on local uh, finance or new local financing uh, uh, financing system for local governments, and I can we can see that there is uh, that there is progress uh, in this um, in this period. So I'm I'm happy that your index uh, shows that uh, there are uh, other challenges with Moldova territorial administrative reform, um, uh, and I should uh, just say to the group that we had uh, last week an impressive. Uh, panel uh, in advice to the prime minister and to the government of Moldova uh, looking at territorial administrative reform with some uh, star names like uh, Roy Ball and Jorge Martinez Vasquez and Anwar Shah and Pavel Svianievich uh, who is on our panel today um, and this is another um, kind of uh, activity and support that LPSA can um, can provide. So I'm going to pass uh, the microphone to Dario Runtic uh, to tell us about Croatia. Thank you, Adrian. Um, now that I think it's all right now. Uh, now that we've uh, heard more of a regional approach, um, I will be building up on um, the work of my colleague uh, Elton Staffa and the, the team on uh, Nalas Observatory. We'll go uh, shortly through what has been going on in Croatia over the, the recent period. And uh, in this presentation, you will see what uh, Pavel's presentation showed for new, new uh, EU member states. Uh, there was this sort of a mishmash uh, over the over the 2000s, uh, with changes that have been taking place uh, because of the uh, the EU accession and, and some other processes. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, in 1990s, uh, Croatia has been going through uh, the process of local government fragmentation. It used to be um, an ex-Yugoslav Republic uh, with 105 local government units, uh, which was in 1990s due to the war, uh, pretty much centralized and territorially fragmented for whatever reasons. And then um, over the course, um, uh, it was going on until 2000s. And basically we uh, uh, increased the number of local government units to 556 and we have 20 regional units. And over the 2000 to 2018, we've been going through all sorts of reshuffling. Uh, we have set up several uh, functional decentralization attempts, some of the centralized uh, processes um, and decentralized uh, attempts uh, were not always accompanied with the fiscal package. Uh, we've been trying to fine tune uh, the tax system. Uh, so there were some intergovernmental uh, changes to the tax system. There are a lot of changes to the tax rates. And then um, the major um, major event over the course of that time was EU accession, uh, which has affected uh, the early uh, part of that period. And of course it affected um, uh, the changes in Croatia after 2013. And um, 
it's probably 2018 um, that could be um, marked as some sort of a new direction or, or a year where, at least for now, um, the public debate about the territorial fragmentation, number of local government units, etc., has uh, subsided and uh, the government has taken a course of fiscal equalization of local government units, and uh, they have moved towards the voluntary amalgamation and functional mergers, um, and we will see how, how that is going to uh, play out. Uh, in terms of legal framework and you know, what, what the indicators we have just seen, um, uh, how do they look in, in practice? Uh, when it comes to the legal framework, generally, uh, local government units are, you know, allowed to carry out whatever functions are not assigned to any other uh, level of the government. And uh, it is also prescribed that local governments have autonomy of decision making in their self-governing scope. Well, when it comes to the autonomy, um, the local governments can actually um, exercise their legislative uh, powers only if national legislation sets grounds for such local decision making, and they usually create uh, a framework for such decision making, and local governments are free to uh, exercise their autonomy within the framework set by the central government. And more often than not, uh, local government decisions are subject to prior approval or consent uh, by a higher level government or um, any other body. When it comes to fire brigades, for example, uh, to appoint a chief fireman, uh, you gotta ask for uh, an approval by the higher fire brigade uh, authority. Um, and when it comes to the capacity to um, take over the higher level uh, government functions, um, sort of a self-initiated decentralization, um, local governments can apply to a higher level government, require the devolution of the function, but they have to prove that they have secured the sufficient fiscal capacity to do so. And uh, regardless of the fiscal capacities, um, higher level government um, still has the right to say no, and usually says no. Um, when it comes to the ability of local government to create such um, fiscal capacity that is needed for the function to be taken over, um, all local uh, tax rates are either set, ranged, or kept by national legislation. So there is a, a limited uh, room for creation of fiscal capacity for new decentralized functions. Um, generally, um, Croatia, uh, Croatian local governments um, have about 12 to 14% of GDP when it comes to um, their expenditures. And I have seen the question in, in Q&A um, uh, section asking for, for changes be, uh, between the newly accessed uh, countries and, and uh, other countries that still have not accessed the EU. And uh, we've seen over some of our work that there is a difference in methodology used to report the figures. So that may explain uh, a part of the difference. And then when it comes to um, the local government revenues, um, they revolve around um, local taxes, uh, some fees and grants and transfers. Um, the most important uh, revenue uh, source is personal income tax that creates 41% of total local government revenue. And Adrian was asking to, during our uh, prep uh, event about the personal income tax surtax. Uh, Croatian local governments have the ability to impose additional uh, surtax to a personal income tax up to 18%. And currently uh, that surtax generates 4% um, of local government revenues. Um, you, you can see like second home tax, beverage tax, gift inheritance, vessels and vehicle tax. Those are all local government taxes which are set or, or kept um, and they are uh, creating 
a, a really small uh, percentage of local government revenues. They serve their purpose, but uh, there could be improved efficiency in legislating the framework for those tax, taxes and also collection. Communal fees um, are quasi property tax in Croatia. It's not called property tax, but we uh, collect it based on the, the sole um, fact that you own a property and we charge it per square meter. Uh, there was also a question of EU grants and transfers. In Croatia, they are, uh, they, they, they they are 7.6% uh, of uh, local government revenues, and that's only local government unit. Uh, there's a lot of EU grants and transfers that flow through uh, budgetary users, schools, kindergartens, uh, regional or local development agencies, and, and other facilities which are part of the local government ecosystem. But uh, for this exercise, I haven't been uh, really uh, collecting the figures to, to uh, show what total local government ecosystem um, makes from the EU grants. But for what it's worth, uh, in, in local government unit only, 7.6%. Uh, recently, we have instituted equalization grant scheme. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. And um, we have decentralization grant scheme that's the funding for the functions that were decentralized in early 2000s to local government revenues. And then um, local governments have a fair share of uh, assets, whether it's business premises or uh, housing units or land, and they generate about 5% of their revenues from asset management. Um, over the, the first half of 2000-2022 uh, 2000, 2000, period, um, in early days, we have had the first wave of decentralization. We call it the first wave, but there was never really a second wave, so uh, I might as well call it the only wave of decentralization. Um, the decentralized um, elementary schools, secondary schools, uh, healthcare, social services, and fire brigades from the central government level uh, to local government level. And um, there was this decentralization package of 6% of revenues um, uh, that came together with, uh, with these decentralized functions. Uh, the amount of funding remained closely the same over the over the time for for these um, services so um, I would assume these are being underfunded at the moment in 2004 there was a decentralization of traffic control um, in terms of uh, measuring the the speed of traffic and um, um, determining if um, you know jaywalking and, and similar similar um, offenses of pedestrians. But in 2008, there was a re-centralization. Uh, the government simply um, decided it was uh, really a, a central government function, took it away. It was never really implemented. It was just legislated in 2004. In 2007, uh, we have had, um, local governments have had the share in corporate income tax up to 2007. Uh, some 40% of total corporate uh, profits were taxed and the share was given to local governments. And in 2007, uh, the government took all of the corporate income tax and uh, decentralized or increased uh, share in personal income tax for local governments. At that point in time, we thought and we calculated it. It was shown that it was no good uh, for local government units, but then uh, in the aftermath of 2008 and 9 uh, crisis, uh, the corporate profits uh, really fell hard. And so uh, in the end, it turned out to be um, uh, a decision that was uh, good for, for local governments. It created some sort of buffer. Dario, and sorry, uh, just... I'm asking to speed up a little bit to allow Ainur to speak as well. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. I have one Thank more you. slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, um, we have had decentralization of construction permitting. And in 2012, the fiscal package that came with decentralized function was simply terminated. Um, a number of years uh, to follow uh, were 
pretty much marked with uh, reductions in personal income tax rates. Uh, the local governments do not really have um, a way to go about defending those uh, rates. There was a fiscal equalization system in 2018, which significantly improved um, local government revenues. And recently, 2001, there was part of the state functions that was uh, decentralized to uh, the regional governments with fiscal package. And uh, just now, uh, two months ago, the government has uh, started uh, the expression of interest process for local government units who are interested uh, to create either joint service departments or go through a process of voluntary amalgamation um, to uh, express the interest to do so and collect some of the funding from the government. That's everything I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, really. And I think your presentation uh, very much linked to, to Pavel's and uh, um, explained in a way uh, the trends uh, in um, uh, during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and I like very much uh, the part on, on the fiscal decentralization, which goes more in depth. So, um, Thank you very much, Ainur, for, for waiting until now. <laughs> and I'm also, uh, I really want to thank uh, to other uh, listeners and viewers from, from Central Asia. It's very late there. Um, so, Ainur, please. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ainur from UNDP, Kazakhstan. So I was asked to, to speak about the centralization in our country. Um, well, we, you know, we come from the practitioner background, so we'll be, I guess today I'll be sharing more uh, from the practitioner point of view, the, the trends, the, what was the, you know, the development trends with the decentralization in our country. Um, although I actually called the presentation as local governance reform in Kazakhstan, because, uh, you know, we come from the highly centralized economy, highly centralized government. So decentralization is not really a, a, a term that we use here, but, uh, you know, it's mostly framed as a local governance reform. But uh, just uh, nevertheless, um, just to go on. Uh, okay. So just to give you some small introduction where I come from, right? So um, this is Kazakhstan. Um, it's a big country, um, 17 regions, uh, three cities uh, of uh, special status, 89 cities, uh, you know, smaller cities, 170 districts. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a, you know, quite a large country, although in terms of the numbers, we're only 19.5 million. So low density, a, a big country. Um, uh, in terms of the latest sort of uh, economic numbers, I just want to say that uh, we in the upper middle income status and uh, on the human development report, we are considered to be a very high human development uh, in terms of the, the AGI index in 2021-22 index. Um, so, uh, just to give you an overview of uh, the way that, uh, you know, the system works here is uh, the state structure. So, you know, everyone reports to the president, so it's, it's a big figure. Uh, you know, they have, we have a legislative, of course, all the three branches of power, uh, which goes to the, you know, local level regions, districts and rural, as you see. Uh, but uh, as, as you go down, you, you get uh, less power, uh, you know, and of course, less uh, autonomy. So, uh, and we, you know, it was interesting to see that there was uh, in, there are indexes on the local autonomy and everything else. But I guess uh, it's not really <laughs> the case for our country. And that's why I see that, uh, you know, uh, our country never, never been in the index. Uh, so because it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a less autonomy given to the, to the uh, a, a local level. But um, uh, we've been looking into it uh, uh, from the historic point of view, on the overview. So we sort of thought that there seems to be this, uh, as, as a colleague from Croatia introduced, we seem to see these four waves of uh, local decentralization in our country. Um, and um, uh, to start from the first one, um, in 1991, 2000, I mean, uh, I think the first wave, it was all about setting the right sort of legislation, setting the sort of uh, in a bigger sort of chunks of the legislation that would allow functioning of the local government. 
So, I mean, in 1991, I had this new law on the local self-governance, uh, government uh, adopted. There was this uh, even a new law on the budgetary system, the, the taxing system, you know, this, uh, even the concept of the local self-government, uh, although it wasn't really introduced in the constitution that came on later. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it was a way towards introducing more strategic sort of a planning system in the country, uh, which led to the adoption of our sort of development strategy in Kazakhstan 2030, which actually included the part on decentralization. The, the second wave uh, we, we see it was from 2000s, and that's when actually more concrete sort of terms started uh, going into our legislation. Um, and it was most importantly was about this budget code and the taxing code of the country. Just, you know, kind of sort of to make an introduction. Uh, the problem is that we, we always have, uh, and that's why, you know, the presentation of Croatia, actually, I thought it was interesting to see, you know, how the local governance is financed. Because in our case, the way the budgetary system works, that given that it is a resource economy, oil economy, the, all the taxes goes to the center. And then from the center, on the subventional basis, they are given as a transfers to local govern, govern, government, right? So the go local governments, although, for example, there might be a oil fields, coal fields, and everything else, the corporate tax goes to the center, and then from the center, it is distributed to the, to the uh, localities. So um, that's why there's not, there hasn't really been a lot of incentives for the local governance to do better because they haven't really depended on the, uh, the, the, the taxing and the relationships with the local uh, you know, population and the companies as well, because so they all depended on the center. And plus the fact that there was no election, right? You know, the, our local entity or the heads of the local uh, authorities, Akins, uh, appointed by the president. Um, you know, somehow there are consultation process with uh, the, the local uh, representative bodies, but there's no sort of a contact with the local population. So that's uh, when um, uh, the new sort of, uh, waves of, of this disagreement came on and saying that why not at least uh, elect the head of the village, you know, why it's not possible. So this was a time when we actually had this experiment in the country uh, that, you know, we for the first time people voted for the head of the village and to see how it works, you know, whether the, you know, the system, someone can be, you know, this person can be trusted if the, the local authorities actually be elected. So there was this new sort of picking up the ways of, you know, this seems to be a strange system, let's introduce new things, looking into the budgetary systems as well. So then came the, the next sort of phase when we actually saw uh, more structured, more sort of thought through sort of a process. And that was the time actually a lot of international organizations in the country actually started and giving more attention to this fact, like, you know, we are UN system, like, you know, World Bank, the rest, because we actually started seeing the, that there could be influence from the local population towards local governments. The, the central government was open to talk about it. And that's when the country actually for the first time had this concept of development of local self-governance. You know, we started talking that the people can, you know, practically influence, you know, there can be more power given. And the issue of capacities, you know, the uh, I actually liked a lot that the previous speakers uh, pointed this issue is that, uh, you know, as the UNDP is an organization who built who really spends a lot of time in the capacity building of the different tires of the government, we actually saw there was this time actually that the capacities at the local level started rising into the scale that they were able to, you know, run the budgets themselves, organize and do more. So that's where what is the time that the, uh, the concept itself allowed uh, introduction of new functions to the local authorities and even the, the fourth level of budgeting system in rural areas. Because previously, you know, like uh, we, heads of villages never had any budget, you know, they're all looking into the head of the oblast or head of the rayon, you know. So that was uh, the time we actually saw more, um, you know, uh, authorities coming over to them. And, um, uh, and of course, the, the reform of the tax system. So now we we sort of uh, you know uh, reach the phase, and of course again I mean the fact that we put in these waves is more based on the practice and what we see. So we now reach the the point when actually um, 
we are talking about elections. You know, we are talking about the direct elections of the heads of oblasts, heads of rayons, heads of villages, and recognize at the level of the head of the state and uh, put into the legislation. So it's sort of a, a, a really uh, um, opening a new space uh, for the local, de- uh, you know, governance development reform in the country, and the fact that we are now talking about the system of uh, local representative bodies, like a local councils at this level, plus people's participation in the budget, you know, sort of decision making, you know, like a sort of uh, more, you know, the democ- democracy in action at the local level sort of a, a, a thing. But I guess the most important is the fiscal decentralization. And this is something that we're still discussing in the country. We're still uh, debating within the country. And we actually think that, you know, uh, we are going towards uh, um, that direction, hopefully. So just to, you know, for your information, just to say that, you know, we're seeing these novelties in our new draft law that is coming towards um, most probably by uh, to approval by the end of the year, there will be decentralization, the simplification of power procurement and creation of these local councils. So see, we have been going through this evolution of, uh, of uh, you know, mutual understanding within the country, the importance, uh, more powers to the local authorities. And it's been going through peacefully, you know, so, so understanding of the fact that it has to be, uh, has to be done uh, within the country. But of course, of course, I mean, although these novelties exist, although we want to do more, uh, there are these challenges and the problems that exist, and we do recognize it. And uh, we always raise this issue with, uh, with our government counterparts. Is of course the fact that there's this lack of sufficient funding, you know, in the regions that limits the capacities, limits the responsibilities of local authorities. And of course, the issue of public trust. I mean, of course, uh, uh, maybe some of you who've been following the events in the Kazakhstan would know that uh, in January of this year, we had this big wave of protests that are not really common to our country. That was this exactly this issue of public trust, you know, that the people were losing the trust to our existing the government and they just were going to the streets. Although, of course, in the media, it could, it could be present, it was presented in a different way, but the issue was that. And so our president has recognized it, and now the uh, direction of his reforms is towards this uh, giving more opportunities for local governance reform in the country. Of course, because of these imbalances that existed in the system, you know, with the planning and execution and uh, giving the resources. And uh, of course, the people's uh, influence over the decision making within the, uh, their uh, uh, region. Um, so, and of course, uh, what we see that is that there is although need to strengthen the control over execution of government decisions at the local level. For example, these audit commissions, you know, that the public would like to be part of the audit commissions. And, um, and of course, there's the issues of, uh, of um, uh, intra-budgetary relations that still has to be decided, um, uh, you know, within the, consist- uh, considering the, within the, the consistent program. Okay, so this is it. Um, just to, I want to simplify and understand that, you know, we've been listening to a lot of presentations. But of course, uh, I'm open for the questions. Please, uh, you know, if there are uh, any questions towards about the Kazakhstan and the course of reforms, I'm happy to answer. So, Oba, thank you very much for, for this opportunity as well. Thank you very much, um, Ainur. Um, and I'm going to go um, through some of the questions that are uh, have been posted in uh, in the Q and A uh, section. I, I want to say that some of the questions have been answered in writing. So if you open the Q and A, you will see there. Of like four open questions, twelve answered, and you can read the and you can read the answers um, right there. Uh, so we will take we are at the end of our time, but we will take 10, 15 minutes more trying to answer the the questions, and maybe we'll have some discussion as well. So I'm going to uh, link from uh, Ainur's presentation right now. There is a question to me uh, regarding Uzbekistan. uh, And it seems that we have a number of uh, uh, viewers from Uzbekistan. So the question is if I can make any recommendations uh, regarding Uzbekistan's regions and any other features Uzbekistan regions um, to improve uh, decentralization and decentralization policy. Um, 
and it's a it's a complex question is quite um, uh, wide um, I would say uh, it is something that uh, we have worked on with our colleagues at UNDP uh, in Uzbekistan and we have um, a draft uh, report let's say with recommendations like this um, I will go um, I will just mention few of them because uh, uh, similar to to Kazakhstan uh, in Uzbekistan, um, th the state is uh, a lot more in control uh, of in control of policy making, of decision making, and as well the state is working on actual implementation of policies and delivery of services. And services, for example, unlike in uh, in Eastern Eastern Europe or in the Caucasus countries, are many times provided by state enterprises. And this reminds me that this is very similar to uh, Tunisia, which is in. Uh, uh, it, it's a North African country, but somehow shares uh, shares common features uh, with with Central Asian countries. But anyway, um, so just few recommendations that we would have to make. One is to rethink the the role of the state and and keep uh, policy making and give. Uh, implementation and service provision uh, to regional and local governments. But in order for the regional and local governments to be able to deliver on these services, um, we would need to uh, define, clarify, and separate the responsibilities of the state, of the regions, uh, and of the districts. And together with the responsibilities we have to separate the budgets right now the the budgets are um, nested one uh, into another so we would need to have separate budgets for the state for the regions for the districts uh, something a recommendation that is similar to what we have heard is happening in in kazakhstan direct elections of hokims they are the executives uh, at the at the a regional level and be, uh, more than that have the the budgets and the, the hakims uh, accountable to the kangashis to the regional um, councils um, and i will i will stop here these are very few um, there, there are a lot more uh, uh, issues to discuss um, uh, and we can share this report if colleagues from UNDP in Uzbekistan uh, are interested. Okay, so this was one question. Um, there is uh, there are a couple of questions related to the fiscal resources in new member states uh, and uh, their link to. Uh, EU regional funds. So has the EU accession process and the EU regional funds um, had an impact that can be measured or demonstrated uh, into the regional and local fiscal resources? So it's a question for Pavel and Nikos and Alexander, and also for Dario. Uh, well, Pavel, please. Uh, I, of course, it's a complex question and we uh, do not have time to go into details, but, um, well, yes, for many countries, including Poland, but also Romania, uh, Croatia, and, and several others, Latvia, Lithuania, as EU structural funds have been very, important for increasing um, financial capacity, not so much in terms of uh, provision of operating services, but in terms of investment capacity. Uh, but well, today in our presentations, we focus on local autonomy index and uh, so not so much on um, financial capacity, but on local autonomy index. And I do not see, I do not think that structural funds 
could really push up uh, the uh, score of local autonomy index. Paradoxically, sometimes they might even uh, work in opposite direction because one of our uh, detailed indicators was a proportion between um, specific conditional grants and general purpose grants. And since EU structural funds are, of course, um, specific grants for individual investments. So in some cases, it might even happen that larger inflow of EU structural uh, funds for investments might marginally lower the score of, of um, financial autonomy. But in general, I there is no direct link between EU structural funds and uh, local autonomy index. There might be indirect link if there are some actions taken, policies taken um, to better adapt to, to European practices. But that would not be a direct link. Thank you very much. Um... Pavel, um, there is a question about um, association of local governments in Central Asia. Is there, I know, is there any association that you know of? Not in, not in Kazakhstan. And no, no. I don't think there is one in Uzbekistan. Uh, it might have been an association um, in um, Kyrgyzstan, but um, that's about it. So there's there's something to work on, certainly, especially <laughs> if we if we start having uh, having direct elections for the executive uh, authority. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, is LAI more about how the local autonomy is regulated by the law and constitution or about actual situation in regard to local autonomy? Alexander. Yes, I'll quickly answer this question. Great question, by the way. Um, in most cases, so what we instructed our uh, country experts to do is to code ideally um, in the de facto situation of a country, but um, for uh, simplification and comparative purposes, uh, we took the, the the euro situation for coding. So what is in in law and in, in constitutions, and then if there are discrepancies in between the legal situation, how autonomy is uh, scored according to um, to what the law says and the actual practical implementation of said autonomy, then we would ask them to mention this in the respective country profile reports, if there are any discrepancies between these situations, just to make that clear. Um, thank you very much. Um, there was um, a comment that uh, Gabor Petteri made um, vis-a-vis -vis the interpretation that Pavel uh, had for um, um, the evolution of Poland and Hungary. And I don't know if we can have uh, Gabor uh, uh, intervene. I don't see, ah, here. So I, I, will, I will pass the floor to, to Gabor just for a short exchange with uh, Pavel. We don't hear you, Gabor. So the, my question was simply about this uh, summary term of recentralization in the two former uh, decentralized countries, Poland and Hungary. I very much agree with the definition on, on Hungary, which is politically driven uh, decentral uh, recentralization during the past decade. I just wanted to understand what was uh, this term pragmatic, what you use for Poland. So if you could go a little bit deeper into, into what does it mean, uh, then I will understand better 
uh, the term. Thank you. Well, I understand this is a question to me, and and I have to say that I need to apologize because it looks like a misunderstanding. Uh, perhaps I was not clear enough. I did not mean uh, that uh, Polish decentralization was pragmatic. I just said, well, I meant that in general, there are two different motives of decentralization, pragmatic and ideological. And, uh, uh, but both in Hungary and in Poland, uh, it was more driven in, by ideological than pragmatic reasons. Although there are some interesting differences between details of this um, way decentralization was operating in both of countries. And I tried to summarize it very briefly um, in my written answer to your question, Gabor. So you may you may check it and and uh, and perhaps other participants may see it as well and we may discuss it further but probably not today because um, time is very short there was uh one question uh from glenn wright about um Territorial reform, administrative reform in Croatia. Uh, Dario, would you? He was asking about some some details about it. We are going to have a session on territorial administrative reform uh, tomorrow evening, but uh, since Dario is here and uh, I don't think we have Croatia tomorrow, um, I'll, I'll let you comment a little bit about the the process and about the results. Thank you, Dario. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for the question, Glenn. Um, well, basically, um, the government um, has offered uh, two options. I mean, um, the government has originally kind of decided not to go with um, forced uh, merger of local governments, like in some countries in the region. Uh, because we have uh, legislative safeguards in place that uh, require uh, municipal inhabitants to vote on referenda whether they agree or, or disagree with with mergers. So the government decided to go with two two uh, options. One is that local governments can either um, perform a function together. Uh, or they uh, can join into a new entity. Um, if they are deciding to join uh, and perform a specific function, uh, they can have like a joint uh, public servant. Um, they uh, share uh, the salary of, of such person and then the government contributes with 30% of, of the wage of this person and some material expenditures or they can establish a joint department, like a joint uh, department for finance, for example. So they do the accounting together and stuff. They get some of the economies of scale. Uh, again, the government chips in with some 30 to 40% um, of expenditures of such department. And they can also decide to, to go big um, with uh, joint kindergartens or other joint institutions. And the government also chips in uh, with some of the funding. There is a specific formula how the funding is calculated, and I've uh, shared the link to official gazette with all of the details on it. And in, in terms of um, joining into a new entity, uh, the government provides double the equalization grant than, than it used to provide to a smaller municipality in the past. And they also uh, clear any outstanding um, loans and um, any current debts, so to speak, to, to make it simplified. So basically, they give you a clean clean start uh, on a municipality that is joining the Big Brother or whatever. So that, that's in general terms. If you're interested in more details, uh, my email is there, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out.
Thank you very much, uh, Dario. I think uh, we have um, answered all the questions and really most of the questions, uh, there were more than 20 questions actually, which we had here. Uh, many of them were answered in writing. Um, I think you can still read them and I hope you read the answers uh, uh, to the specific questions. Um, we have passed uh, our time with 15 minutes, so I think it's time to, uh, to close and to thank uh, all of you for participation and for staying with us for so long. And I wonder if Serdar has any, any kind of closing words. Um, not really. I think we are over time and this was a great discussion, fascinating discussion. It's a great uh, success. I thank all of the participants and the, the attendees and uh, looking forward to another discussion tomorrow. Thank you all.